Next uh, section that we're going to deal with is uh, deals with our child protection policies. Okay, and uh, this is already this is in our policy and procedure manual. And so uh, one of the reasons th this is one of the reasons that Reed and I decided to even do this workshop uh, the first time we did it because we realized, hey, we have these policies that we voted into existence, what, in March of 2015, I think is when we did it, and we're not following them all. And so uh, that's not good. So uh, we felt like we needed to educate everybody, uh, especially all of our children's and youth workers, uh, and a lot of them went through this the first time we did it, uh, but we need to all be on the same page about how we're gonna protect our children, okay? Uh, so as we go through this, um, this, this sheet right here, you're gonna wanna and then also uh, this sheet right here with these little highlighted sections, that's gonna uh, become important too as we go through it and also continue to follow along in your listening guide, all right? So child protection, what can we say about it? Well, uh, a very smart man that I had the opportunity to work with one time, his name's Bill Bartlett, he said the only thing worse than having no policy for protecting children is having one and not following it not following policy borders on criminal negligence if something were to happen. So if something were to happen around here, and we pray that it never does, and, uh, and something criminal was uh, even, even somebody was accused, uh, one of the first things they're gonna ask us is, what is your policy, all right? If we tell them our policy, the second question they're gonna ask is, are you following it, okay? And if we're not following our policy, then we're the ones that are negligent, okay? The policies are there to protect our children, and so we have to follow those policies, okay? And so it makes us criminally liable if we're not following the very policies that we all voted into effect, okay? So uh, another smart, uh, well, that's, that's later. We'll talk about that other smart quote from a guy named Reed Endel. Um, so I'm just waiting your appetite for that. You're, you're waiting for the Reed Endel quote, okay? <laughs> All right, uh, this is in our policy and procedure. Our ministry, and it goes on to say, to all children under 18, all children under 18, and includes both paid and volunteer persons who work with children, okay? Well, most of you in here are volunteer, but you're part of this, okay, if you work with children. So then the question is, who may work with our children? Well, when we talk about paid workers, in other words, these folks are hired by the personnel committee. They must be at least 21 years old, and I know this may be a little difficult to read on the screen, but yeah, but you should be in your listening guide there. Uh, they must fill out an application and they must provide references. They must pass a criminal background check. Uh, and they must give evidence of Christian conversion. So those are our paid workers, okay? Poly, uh, the personnel committee handle all them. Volunteer workers, on the other hand, are enlisted by ministry leaders like Reed and myself, Brother Jeff, uh, and, and uh, even like uh, uh, Amy Price as our GA uh, coordinator, and you guys know what I'm talking about. All right, these volunteer, and, and Wendy right now would be considered a ministry leader because she's in uh, getting people involved with VBS, okay? So these are you guys. They must be a member of FABC for at least six months, okay? Why would we make such a policy? Any ideas? Exactly. So we know who we have working with our children. This is a sad truth, but one of the things that happens with predators, uh, because Churches have become, I hope that in the past, you know, something would happen and there were times where it was kind of swept under the rug and the person was just told to leave. Well, what are they going to do? They're just going to go to another church. And what's the first thing they're going to do? Man, I love working with children. Can I get involved with children? You understand? And, uh, and, and one of the things that we have a problem with nowadays, okay, and this may be a little church reform thing that's different than reform church, but uh, there was, that was a theological joke. That people, <laughs> all right, but <laughs> this is 
<laughs> this is a, maybe a, a, something we need to think about in, in, in how we do church. But when we request a letter from churches, we don't ever ask for a report from that church on what kind of people these folks were. So we don't know what, what they were involved in. You know, maybe they split the church. Who knows? Okay, but it, you know, that might be good information to know. That's why for six months we got to watch you, all right, and we gotta we gotta know you for six months, all right. Um, they must. So when we joined, y'all didn't. Uh, we we weren't asked to teach or take any position for a year. Yeah. And you know, we were anxious to come in and worship. Mm -hmm. But I understood. Right. And I was that. Yeah, I'll give y'all a perfect example. Uh, Vanessa Walker. You guys know Vanessa? Uh, she's our special needs coordinator, okay, uh, for working with our special needs children. Well, when Vanessa came in, Vanessa was ready to go. But I knew Vanessa, right? So I knew what kind of person she was. I knew that she'd be great working with our children. But this is our Hey, cool your jets for six months, and then, you know, six months in one day, you know, we'll get you involved, okay? So uh, this is why we do what we do. Must be able to work well with children and so we don't want them working with children okay if they can't embody those core values that we talked about earlier then those are not the kind of people that need to be working with children uh, must pass a criminal background check obviously if they can't do that and and believe it or not I've had to have some really difficult conversations with some folks even in our own church who wanted to work with children but because I knew they had a criminal background and I knew what the criminal background area was in, I had to say, look, I think uh, you might would rather get involved in another ministry other than working with children. And that's a hard conversation to have with somebody, but we're, we have to protect our children. Okay? And so uh, you must be 21 or you must work under the direct supervision of someone who is and meets all of the above criteria. So we have teenagers who work in nursery, who are going to be working in VBS and uh, in other areas with our children. They're allowed to do that, but they're never considered an adult. You get what I'm saying? They always have to be working with somebody else who meets these criteria. We don't require our teenagers to go through a criminal background check, obviously, because uh, they're under 18. Okay. So the following people must have a background check in order to work with children. Those involved in overnight activities with children, anyone counseling, anyone involved in a mentoring, and got, this comes straight out of our policies, okay? So I know that's, that, that sounds kind of vague in, because, I mean, couldn't any of you be considered to be involved in a mentoring program or a ministry if you're involved in VBS? Absolutely, okay? And anyone having, this gets even broader, anyone having occasional one-on-one -on -one contact such as church-sponsored athletic team coaches and vehicle drivers. Well, as a VBS worker, whether you're working registration, kitchen, or wherever else, you are actually going to have more than occasional contact with children. You're going to have contact with them every night for five days. And all right, so um, I think this means you guys are going to have to go through a background check. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> all right, so how does this happen? Okay, because that's the next question. You know, am I going to have to have shock therapy or a lot, go through a, a lie detector test or anything like that? All right. Are you going to, like, you know, if you find out that I got a speeding ticket last year, are you going to, like, give, give that out all over the church? No, no. All right. How does it happen? Well, you'll be asked to fill out and sign an authorization form giving us permission to run a background check on you. That's this form right here, okay? All right. Now, for our children's workers, if you're a children's worker who's going to be working with children all the time, we want all of this information filled out, okay, because we want to know what ministries you've been involved in, what kind of skills you have, how do you sense God calling you to work with children. We realize that some of you don't work with children all the time. You're just going to work with VBS. So that's why you have these highlighted areas. I need that information from you guys so that I can authorize a background check on you. Okay. The rest of it, we're going to assume that you're working VBS because uh, the Lord has led you to do that because you see children as a blessing, not a burden. And you had somebody twist your arm, okay? So, um, 
But so I need each of you to fill one of those out and uh, sign it and give it to me so that I can run that background check. Uh, also, uh, if you decline, you're going to be unable to work with children. So you may say, I don't want to do it. Well, that's fine. We'll direct you to another ministry. Okay. Um, background check authorization and results will be kept confidentially in the church office. So what happens is uh, once uh, I get these, I go to our website that we use is backgroundchecks.com. I run a background check on you, and uh, it'll give us the results of that. Uh, that's kept uh, securely online as part of our, um, I don't print the report out. It's kept online as part of our uh, account there. And then uh, I'll just write on the top, pass or fail of this, and we'll put it in a folder, which will then be kept under lock and key. All right, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So nobody has access to that other than Miss Charlene and myself and Reed and Brother Jeff. What constitutes disqualification? Disqualification will be determined by church ministerial staff on a case-by-case -case basis. And, you know, I mentioned to you a little while ago somebody wanting to work with the children. You know, I told them, I said, you're going to have to have a background check run on you, and I already know what it's going to turn up. So they backed out before even the background check was run. You understand what I'm saying? So um, uh, generally the following may lead to disqualification. Convictions for offenses involving children. Offenses involving violence, dishonesty, illegal substances, indecency, and conduct contrary to our vision and our mission. Okay? So we find out that, hey, you know, the Spiveys went down to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. Things got a little wild. They got arrested. <laughs> you know, uh, say, well, you know, I know that would never happen, but so. Uh, <laughs> but you didn't get arrested. <laughs> There's no record. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Y'all, I was down there last week for this doctoral seminar, and I could see where people could get into a lot of trouble down there in the, in the French Quarter. Uh, yeah, moving right along. I'm walking around going, this is a place I would never bring my children and wife. Failure to disclose a criminal conviction on the application. All right, so those are all things that would get you disqualified. All right, when we talk about children, we have check-in and check-out uh, policies and things like that. Uh, first of all, parents are given a pager when children are dropped off. This is specifically talking about nursery, okay? A sticker identifying the child is attached to the child. Again, we're talking about nursery policies here. A pager must be presented upon return to pick up the child. The child is not released to anyone who does not have the pager, and only nursery workers are allowed in the nursery. Children over the age of three are not permitted in the nursery. Okay, that's, that's nursery policies. Let's move on and talk about some other things. Now, nursery workers are not allowed to give children anything to eat or drink except for what's been approved as a snack. Uh, they must check the diapers every 30 minutes and follow proper sanitation procedures. They must sanitize all toys after every session, and they must provide an activity for children while keeping them in the nursery. General policies. These policies apply everywhere, whether it's nursery, whether it's children, whether it's VBS, whatever event it is, okay? A minimum of two unrelated workers at all times when children are being supervised during church activities regardless of the number of participants location or activity why is unrelated so important well because in the court of law a husband and a wife are treated as one unit because they assume one is not going to testify against the other okay so that means that when we are providing workers if we put a husband and wife in a room, we've got to automatically put a third person in there because that's the only way we count as having two people in a room, okay? So um, that's also why Wendy is going to have three people in a room uh, in every class, all right? Uh, now, husbands and wives may not end up in the same class, but we're going to go ahead and have that third person just to make sure if somebody has to step out, then you still got a second person in there. For Bible study groups,
that other adults are nearby and classroom doors are open or windows uncovered. So this happens on some Sunday mornings when maybe uh, a worker is sick or something like that. We allow them to go ahead and be in that, that room with those students, but they have to open the door and there are people kind of monitoring in the halls so that we know what's going on, all right? In counseling situations, doors must be left open and windows uncovered. And I'll just tell you that when I counsel youth, uh, if the only time that we'll step into my office is if there is something going on in the youth room, okay? This is one of the reasons I kind of moved my office up to the third floor is because it provides a place for me to counsel with students, but we leave the doors open. We, there's nothing over my windows anyway, and so we're counseling right there. What I try to do is to counsel right out in the common area, okay? I, I try not to even ever go into a room. So if at all possible, unless they just request it, that's what we do. And Reed does the same thing with children. We, we keep them out where everybody can see because we don't want there to be any, any appearances of wrongdoing. Children must be, in, and, and this is important for you because let's say that a child comes to you this week. You may not be his teacher even, but he comes to you and says, I need to talk to somebody. And you feel like God is saying to you, this child needs to talk to somebody right now. You need to remember, don't take them in a room and shut the door. That's a no-no. You can go sit on the couch in the gathering space. You can sit at one of these tables in here. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, I wouldn't even go into the sanctuary if nobody's in the sanctuary. You need to stay where there's people in the general area, okay? Make sense? Children must be encouraged to take care of their own bathroom needs. This is going to be important for VBS. If not possible, two adults should be present, okay? So you don't want one adult to go into a bathroom with a kid and try to help them because what are you going to do if, if that kid comes back later and says, so-and-so touched me, you know? Now, we would go, well, they were probably trying to help them pull their pants up or something like that. But if he starts going or she starts going around and parents get involved, I mean, it's just, but if you have two adults there, then, you know, you, you, you got witnesses, okay? If not possible, two adults should be present or bathroom doors should be propped open. No adult should ever be alone behind closed doors with a child for any reason, period. All right, the following, this is a continued. Overnight co-ed events must be attended by workers of both genders. FABC workers do not administer medications of any kind except in the case of life-threatening circumstances, okay? This is important. And uh, we're actually, uh, Angie has made some suggestions on our current policy on that, and we're, we're gonna work to even uh, kind of beef up our policies a little bit more in this area. Angie suggested that we have a nurse or somebody like that uh, to either go with our our uh, trips or maybe if we're at an event where there is a nurse that that nurse administer the medication not us and and I'm just be honest we I mean we've been on youth trips before and kids are like I got a headache I need some Advil and you don't even I mean you just you don't think nothing about it because you give your kid Advil right but we're we're not in that day and age anymore so uh, so no, no workers are allowed to give out medication. I know y'all are not, you wouldn't do that anyway, right? But I don't know, that includes, you know, meth or anything like that. Don't give them anything. <laughs> <laughs> FA, yeah, just let them suffer. <laughs> Come, they got their DTs, just let them suffer. <laughs> exactly. FABC workers do not administer corporal punishment at any time or in any form. Okay, we don't spank kids or push kids or, you know, anything like that. Kick kids. We don't do any of that. Every child participating in a church-sponsored trip or off-campus event must have an FABC medical and liability release form on file with the church. Okay? Now, how do we handle child abuse around here? How do we handle even the allegation of child abuse? I can tell you we're going to take even an allegation of child abuse very seriously. Okay, so uh, let's talk first about a, first a little bit about some types of abuse you might see. Physical abuse, which uh, usually if there are uh, the, the, the signs of physical abuse are, tend to be pretty visible. I remember back when I was teaching, um, 
I had a kid in my class who he wasn't doing very well. We had parent-teacher conferences. You know, I kind of told his mom the truth. Well, she went home that day, and she got a studded dog collar. And she beat that kid with that studded dog collar, okay? He shows up the next day, and all up and down his arms, he's got these little blue, well, he looks like he's got polka dots all over him. And, I, and so I pull him out in the hall and ask him, you know, what is that? And he told me that his mom got on to him because I gave her a bad report and that she spanked him with a dog collar. So what did I do? I didn't go, yay, mom, <laughs> way to keep your kid accountable. I took him straight to the nurse and the administrator, and, you know, that was reported. Yeah. Yep. And so DHS was contacted, and um, and that was you know it, it was dealt with. It was investigated. So uh, you know if you see something that you think even as they're passing in the line, you see something and you go, oh, you know that's the shape of a handprint on that arm. You know, just be aware. Emotion. Yes. Emotional abuse is a little bit harder to, to see, but uh, I mean, and that a lot of times that comes as you get to that is that is serious too. Sexual abuse. If you suspect a child has been abused, it must be reported to the senior pastor immediately. That's in our policy. Okay, if you suspect it, it has to be reported immediately. You have to get us involved in that so that we can take the next proper steps. Okay. All right, some more thoughts on that. What is our procedure in the event of an alleged abuse by an FABC worker? In other words, it comes to our attention that a child has said that an FABC worker, be it a ministerial staff worker or be it just a children's or youth worker, has uh, been inappropriate. Well, first of all, we're going to notify the parent and the guardian right off the bat. Then we're going to, the worker immediately is going to be placed on leave and must remain away from the premises until an, a full investigation has taken place. Civil authorities are notified and we will cooperate fully with them, okay? Insurance company is going to be notified and the senior pastor is going to act as our media liaison. Guys, this is so important right here because what happens in churches when something I, I give you a perfect example I heard a story just last week where there was a, um, a disagreement between a pastor and his deacons some of his deacons not all of them well it turned into a, a pretty big issue in the church information got out in the community and the deacons fired or at least this continued. And their intention was that they called the church into a special business meeting in order for this to happen. He got done preaching. He didn't know any of this was coming. And, and tried to call him into a special time of uh, business. That no, and it turned into kind of a, a free-for-all, okay? Well, it didn't happen, right, because the church and the other deacons didn't allow it to happen, but the news media had already been alerted to all this, and so they're waiting outside. Not that our news media would ever do this, right? <laughs> so they're waiting outside when people come out, and they're, they're sticking the microphone in different people's faces because they want someone to share their opinion okay don't you, you better believe that if something were to ever happen where even an allegation you know that's news okay and so it is important for us as a church that, I mean this is something we ought to talk about church wide no matter what it is okay uh, you guys remember when Candy was spending her time in that um, resort in Macedonia um, <laughs> It, it was the same situation. 
it, I, I, I put some stuff on Facebook that got quoted by a local news channel. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I didn't give you permission for that. Well, they don't need permission. Facebook's a public place, all right? So, so it's important that we realize that as a church, when it comes to talking to the community about things like this, there is one person and one person alone that speaks as our uh, liaison, and that's Dr. Jeff Myers. And if Dr. Jeff Myers is the one that things have been said about, then someone else will be appointed to do that role. That will be me. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> that would be even more dangerous. <laughs> Because <laughs> you'd probably be up for murder. But, <laughs> but, but anyway, um, the rest of us, our, res our typical response ought to just be, I don't have a comment on that at this time. We don't have a comment on that at this time. Okay? So whatever it is. Okay? Um, all other representatives must refrain from speaking to the media. Pastoral visit is going to be scheduled if necessary, and if the worker is not found innocent, they'll be removed from the position as a worker at FABC. Notice this is important language. It doesn't say not found guilty, because there could be all kinds of things that could happen in a court case that would keep somebody from being found guilty, and yet they'd be as guilty as day, right? Well, no day's guilty. Guilty as night, maybe, okay? Um, so unless they're found completely innocent, they're not going to be allowed to work with children. Okay? That doesn't mean they can't come here, okay? but it does mean they can't be around children. All right, so that brings us to the end of that session. That one took a little bit longer, but it's good stuff that I think you all need to know. So anybody got any questions? And this is a time when Angie is going to... Let me ask this first. Do you have anything you want to add? Hey, let's give her a mic. All of our YouTube viewers are getting free training. <laughs> the most important thing for you as volunteers is to, right this minute, take ownership in what you've just heard. Don't uh, say that's great for us to have as a church policy. Don't fall into the trap of saying, well, that's not really that important. Um, what you have just been given and the document that you have that you guys have approved as a church now becomes binding for each and every one of you. So you take ownership in that. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, Wendy talked about having three people in every room for Vacation Bible School. True, Wendy? How many of those people might be students under the age of 21? Only one? Or could two of the three be under 21? No, yeah, only one. Okay, all right. That helps because um, if you've put a policy in here, which you have, that says we will only have a person under 21 under the supervision of someone uh, else who is 21 and approved. So if you have two people who are students, let's just use a for instance, let's say you did have one adult and a 19-year-old and a 16-year-old as your leaders in a vacation Bible school. You, as the adult, over 21, I don't think there's anybody in the room that's not pretty much over 21, true? No. Uh, exactly. Some of us way over 21, and I don't mean you, Lord, and I mean me. Um, <laughs> if you are that person, a lot of times I've seen people in churches, well, we'll just send the two young people down the hall with the group of kids. What have you just done? You've just violated a policy. Um, there is not an easier time for something to happen with kids than in transitions. Take ownership in every single one of these. There are policies in here that say when you work in the nursery, you will provide an activity when you are with the children. There are a lot of people who work in churches who don't think that's important. They think an activity means they have a clean diaper and they're not crying when they get picked up. You've just written a policy and approved it that says we'll provide an activity when we're with kids. Now, let's pretend that something really awful happens because that's all we're going to do is pretend. We're not going to allow it. Let's pretend that something is violated in these policies. When you are looked at in terms of liability, they're going to look at every single one 
of these policies. And they're going to check to see that you have followed every single one. It brings the policy that has potentially been violated into question, and you lose all credibility. But I am trying to help you see the importance of this rising to the top and not being something that we just pay lip service to. So right this minute, everything that Wayne has said, everything that you have in that document becomes yours. Can we agree on that? Every single person in this room, that, that is now yours to own because the importance of protecting your kids is the biggest thing that you will face, especially in terms of kids that you don't know, because there'll be kids that you don't know coming to Vacation Bible School. There'll be scenarios that you're put in that aren't your typical scenarios. So when you stop to think, now don't think about this as a great meeting that Wayne went over some good things and we've got all these good policies. You think about What's my responsibility in this, and how do I own making this happen to the best of my ability? So ownership is the biggest thing for you right now. I have a question. Elevator. Okay. okay. Specifically? Specifically, when Dr. Kemp and I did it, we had 28 children. We had four youth helping us. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're not going to be able to fit all those in an elevator, like you said. So, I mean, tip, typically we've been using the stairs. We, we, we very rarely use elevator for transporting children anymore. What if the, what if the teacher can't make it up the stairs? We'll have to send two up with them. Well, on, and that's why we have three, too, because yeah. typically a lot of times the, the teacher will stay in the room to, to get prepared for Bible, you know, like make sure everything's ready. Everything that you do should be the two-person rule. Everything. Like you're in a class. Everything you do. An elevator, uh, texting a kid, uh, a preteen kid. If you're the preteen teacher and you're texting them something that happened in vacation Bible school, there's a two-person rule there as well. You text another adult in that same scenario. Everything's a two-person rule. Now, you may have to be... Um, conscientious of how you can always make that happen. It may be that you send a group upstairs with two leaders and there's another leader upstairs that is able to take over from one of those leaders who can then come back down and be the second person in the second trip. Again, this is ownership for you guys. Now all of this becomes important for you to figure out all these kinds of situations and yeah. how you fit into these policies. And we do have in our policy uh, for Bible study groups, one worker may lead a group provided other adults are nearby. So the workers don't necessarily have to be the workers for that group. If Reed is walking the hall, then Reed counts as a worker who can count as the second. You, you see what I'm saying? Like our registration yeah, our registration they people. As long as there are other adults around, right. you know, yeah. you're... That, you're that was just something that we, we faced. Yeah. Yeah, sure every child that registers is going to have to fill out a section for food allergy. Jane, I think we, we just didn't, we strayed away, didn't stray away from anything with nuts and stuff. We just took, because we have a lot that have that. So I think last year we just didn't serve anything with those. Uh, and I want to reiterate what you said. You were talking happen to be someone who's working registration. Please don't fall into the trap of, I don't because you've just seen a, an example of why that's important. When uh, a licensing agency comes in to license your church for childcare, if you have any type of paid childcare, they're gonna look down to your maintenance people who might do nothing more than pass your kids in the hall. Now you're thinking in those broad senses as well. Other questions?
All right, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back.